unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Today, I want to share from the Gospel of St. Luke, the 12th chapter, the 22nd verse. Luke, the 12th chapter, uh, the 22nd verse. The Bible says, Jesus said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on, for the life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. The life is more than meat, the body is more than raiment. 24 says, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouses nor barn, and God feedeth them, how much more are ye better than the fowls? Which of you, with taking thought, can add over to his stature one cubit? He's asking a question. So if ye therefore be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not, yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe ye, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. In fact, the Amplified would say the heathen, you know, the people, the pagans of this world seek after. And your father knows that you have the need of these things. But rather seek you the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. Now, when we begin with where Jesus Christ is speaking from, in honestly analyzing why Jesus says the very words that he says to his disciples, I believe he saw a generation that was so deluded about God's provision, was so mistaken about the ways of God and the Spirit and was worried and in confusion and in frustration because they were not only awakened, but they had the evidence of luck. Ladies and gentlemen, there are Christians that are sleeping hungry across the world. There are Christians that do not have clothes across the world. There are Christians that cannot afford the basic necessities of life. And so you'll ask yourself, oh, well, that's not me. So don't assume that this sermon is not yours. Because as I'm continuing to say a few things, God is going to open your eyes to a lot of things. There are Christians who are not lacking. But one time they woke up and some happened to either their business, their finances, their jobs. They probably, since they were little, they never lacked. And at one point in life, they woke up and they were lacking. They were not born that way, but they lost it all. Some melt wealth and could put on anything they wanted, but they woke up one day and they had nothing. So it's not just where people are at in the time of their life. But we're looking for the guarantee that this should never happen to you or your children, or your children's children. The Bible says, I was once young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed begging bread. There are principles, the things that we can teach ourselves, connect with ourselves, and teach our children and children's children. And on a bigger scale of things, the church of Jesus Christ needs to grow into a certain understanding of the things of the Spirit. So we can take on the responsibility that God has so called us. Because the church of Jesus cannot be poor. The ministry of the Spirit cannot lack, should not lack, and will not lack. 
But you see, there are people who are flowing on the winds of provision, but they do not know how to preserve this. And so I have seen very rich people lose it all one day, and they have nothing to their name. I've seen people who are starving, but they once owned millions of dollars. So you need not only to know how God provides and leads and defines your spaces of provision, but also how to sustain and preserve. How to sustain and preserve. Beyond that preservation, how to multiply what you're given by God. Because one thing to, you know, have a consistent salary for 10 years. <laughs> it's one thing to have a consistent amount for 20 years. There are people who have been paid the same salary for the past 25 years, for the past 30 years probably have a business. Listen, even if you're earning a million dollars every year, but you've been earning a million dollars every year for the past 20 years, by all rights, you are stuck. You are stuck, yes? You have provision, but you're stuck. Why? Because you're not increasing. You're not multiplying. You're not going upward. The Bible says the path of the just is supposed to shine brighter and brighter into a perfect day. The message version says the longer they live, the brighter they shine. God has called you to a deliberate from glory to glory experience. God has called you to a consistent life of increase, multiplication for the rest of your life. Not only financially, but in every aspect. And this is our message. We've been preaching this for years. We just give you different facets of looking at this. Because as we continue to share these things, the pictures become more clear for you. The things that are not very clear or are still confusing are dealt away with so you have a clarity of vision that you have no excuse you see you have no excuse so jesus tells us take no thought if you read it from the amplified version specifically the 22nd verse he says do not be anxious or be troubled with cares about your life as to what you will eat or about your body as to what you will wear do not worry. He's saying do not care. Do not be anxious. It's easy when you have the means. It's not easy when you don't have the means. Or it's not easy when you lost it all. Hello? But that's not where I'm taking you tonight. We're going to some deeper. But I need to at least get this out of the way. And then he says in the next verse, For the life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. Now, many people have misinterpreted the 23rd verse to mean that it doesn't matter whether I eat much as long as I have life. It doesn't matter whether I eat well as long as I have life. Or it doesn't matter what I wear as long as I cover my body. That's not the implication of Luke 12, 23. When God says the life is more than the meat and the body is more than the raiment, when you go back to the Greek translation of that, he's saying literally, if I have given you life, then I will give you meat. Or if I have given you a body, then I have provided for the raiment of that body. It's the cause and effect law. It's the law of cause and effect. That's the bigger picture of Luke 12, 23. He's saying that I could not have given you one and not given you the lesser responsibility of that one. And not given you the thing that follows that because the one I gave you was of greater quality, quantity, substance and life than what you are seeking for. That's what Luke 12, 23 means. And I mean that you give the excuses of, you know, you know, maybe I might not be eating or probably I slept hungry for two days, but, you know, I have life and that's important. Well, there's a guy who's eating every day, but he's sickly. That's not what God is saying. That's not what God requires you to interpret that scripture for because that's not what he meant. He meant that if I have given you life, which is a greater quality of a thing, then why should you worry that I will not give you meat? That's what he's saying. Or some of you say, oh, you know what? It doesn't matter as long as I have any clothes. If I put on, you know, this is maybe a little shirt, trousers, I don't care as long as there are clothes. You know, you're putting on that, I'm putting on this, but we're all putting on clothes. No, listen, that's ignorance. God is trying to tell you here that if I gave you a body, then I was going to cover it. Because from your fallen nature and the sense of your consciousness that you were naked, I have willed to clothe you. I clothed your patriarchs in the garden, your father and mother, Eve and Adam. So I intend to give you raiment. The law of cause and effect, if you understand it as a believer, you'll see that some of the things some of you are believing for, 
the way you even go to God sort of gives the impression that you are not convinced of the things that should follow, the effects of the things God has caused for you. And that is both unbelief and ignorance in the way God works. You must know the way of the Spirit. It's a prudent thing to know how God thinks because you pray in a more finely tuned pattern of prayer. He gave you a body. He is meant to dress it. He gave you life. He is meant to feed it. He gave you breasts. They are meant to nurse a child. You cannot accept to be barren. He gave you a womb to carry life. You cannot accept to be barren. That's what we're saying. He gave you eyes to see. You see, so you cannot accept to be blind. He gave you ears to hear. So you can refuse to be deaf. He gave you a tongue to speak. So you can refuse anything that makes you dumb. He gave you strength in your body so you can, you know, withstand and do all the things that you're meant to do as a person. The cause-effect law, you must understand that there are certain things God has sent for provision because they must follow the distinctive provision, the original provision, the original idea, the greater quality of thing he has given you. So, did he give you a ministry to fail? Did he give you a church for it to empty? Did he give you a marriage for you to divorce? Did he give you children for them to fail you? Did you get a car to die in an accident? You know one time somebody gave an example years ago. And he says, you know, God can deny you certain things because he wants to save you. And then they gave a very lame example. And they said, for example, he can refuse to give you a car because he knows you're going to die in a car accident. Listen, even if God doesn't give me a car, I still sit in cars. I could die in any car anyway. If I don't know how to preserve myself through faith. Some people think like that. That maybe he has not given me a wife because maybe if he gives me a wife, I'll mess her up. Or he has not given me a husband because maybe I'm too tough, I'll punch him. You know, there's people who think things. You know, and then they assume that because of where they're thinking from, God connects from where they're. No, 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 no. Listen, God is up here and he's only attuned to his word and truth. You either understand how the mystery of truth works, the power of God works, or you lose it. Okay? So he continues to say, now we're going deeper here. So he says, consider the ravens. Now, God is opening us up to a deeper revelation of divine providence. He says, consider the ravens. For they neither sow nor reap. Which neither have storehouses nor barn, and God feedeth them. He says, How much more are ye better than the fowls? I'm going to say something that is so dangerous, but I'll justify it by scripture because it's going to frustrate some of your theologies. When we talk about the realm of food and raiment, it's not in the realm of seed and harvest. It's not. We're talking about food to eat and clothes to wear. It's not in the realm of seed and harvest. And I'll qualify that. Okay? He gave an example of the ravens. He said, the raven does not sow and neither does it reap. He says, the raven does not have a storehouse. It's not even in the realm of saving or barns. Heaping up for yourselves you know, stirring up for a bad day. But he says, but they have food to eat. So if we're talking about the provision of food, it's not in the realm of sowing and reaping. It's not in the principle of sowing and reaping. It's in another, and I'll explain it. So he's saying, if the ravens, the birds, the fowls of the air, they don't do any of these things and I provide for them, how much more are you? Remember, the fowls are you. Everything came out from the ground. Genesis 2 tells you, and God formed from the ground the beasts of the earth and the fowls of the air. But also, man was formed from the ground. We all have a connection to the ground. The fowls of the air, the beasts of the earth, they all have a connection to the earth. Okay? But you were the finest creation from the earth because you were formed. You were created in the image and likeness of God. The fowls of the air were not. So if the fowls of the air were not created in the image and likeness of God, why should it be harder for that which is created in the image and likeness of God to get food 
than the raven which is not created in the image and likeness of God, only in the idea of God. And he says, this one does not sow. Oh, some people say, no, you know, they don't sow because it's not their responsibility. No, 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 no. God has said, how much more you? He says, are you not much more better than the fowls? You see, now he's defining value. He's saying, you have a greater value than a bird in the air. Than a crow. You're better than it. But he has said, but I have provided for it food. It has not sowed. It has not reaped. It does not have a harvest. It carries no storehouse, nor a barn. But when it's hungry, there is enough provision for it on the earth. He says, aren't you better? Meaning, food is not even supposed to be in the realm. Oh, yes, we teach people that the reason why you're sleeping hungry is because you did not tithe, you didn't give, you didn't... No, 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 no. I'll explain that. Then he continues in verses 27. And he says, consider the lilies, how they grow. How they grow. Because if you fail to consider how the ravens are provided for in the place of food, meat to eat, let us go in the realm of clothing and growth. Now, he's telling you, consider how the lilies grow because God is trying to tell you, enter the spirit realm and understand the principle that grows the lily. And he says, they toil not, they spin not, yet he says, yet I say to you, that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, let me explain something here. Now, when the Bible says that the lilies don't toil, the word for toiling is copia. And copia means to grow weary, tired, exhausted because of labor. You know, as the lilies don't labor to get tired, they don't labor to being weary, they don't labor to fatigue. The other word there is fatigue. They don't labor to fatigue. They don't labor to a wearisome effort. Neither do they spin. They don't need the energy to go in circles of confusion to find their own way to grow. But he says that not even Solomon, God compared the lilies to the glory of Solomon's raiment. And let me explain this. Because Solomon, in all his wealth, means he had all the gold he needed, he had all the silver he needed, he had all the precious stones he needed, he had all the clothes he could ever wear. But you see, anything Solomon would ever wear was man-made by provision. It was man-made. So God is saying that regardless of the most arrayed man in man-made provisions of raiment, they can never match the provisions of God when he touches things that concern him. He has given an example of a lily. A lily, they sit in the wild. They don't need to be attended to. But God says, even those that will never be seen by man, he even gives beauty and arrays them in such beauty of raiment, even when no eye will ever see them. They are beautiful, even without cameras. They're not dressing up for a service. They're not dressing up for a party. They're not dressed up for, you know, an interview. There are places I believe man might never see. But even if you might never see them, they'll still maintain their beauty because it's in the nature of God to beautify things. Hallelujah, glory to God. But listen to this. He says, if you consider the lilies, they don't have a worrisome effort. They don't labor to fatigue. They don't work so hard. They don't do anything. They don't, you know, spin or rotate in confusion and manipulating ways to grow. Consider how they grow. Because he's saying, the lilies are my work of provision. Solomon was the work of men for provision. For beautification and raiment. And he says, it doesn't matter how many, you know, tailors Solomon had. How many fashion designers Solomon had in all beauty and wealth that he could afford in this world. Nothing compares to the beauty that God has given to the lily that is done with its doing, even the grass of the field, that tomorrow will be picked and burned. He said, I have provided for this way more. He's trying to say that even in the best human ability and work of things to bring beauty and raiment, 
none will ever match what I, God, can do when I choose to work on you to beautify you and anything considering your life. He's saying, consider them. Consider how the lilies grow. So, then, you choose either to go God's way in how provision is given and beauty is given and food is given, or you go the human way. But he has said, Solomon couldn't match. Solomon couldn't match. But you see, you're even worried about what you'll eat. You're even worried about what you'll drink. And he said, but one, if you worry, are you going to add a cubit to your stature? Is your worrying going to bring food? It will not. Is your worrying going to bring raiment? It will not. No. You're going to say, oh, I'm worried. Even if you worry for a thousand years, it's not going to change anything. Because God does not look to your worry and provide. He does not look to your anxiety to give you meat. He does not look to your troubling to give you clothes. No. He doesn't work in emotional realms. He works in revelational realms. In the realms of revelation. Now, follow me. So, he says, if then God so clothes the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow it's cast in the oven, how much more will he clothe you? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye doubtful in your mind. Don't seek for food, don't seek for raiment, neither doubt God in your mind. He says, for all these things do the heathen, the unbelievers, the pagans of this world seek after. In other words, people who don't know God are troubled about food. People who don't know God are troubled about clothes and what they'll wear. And they have to be troubled because they don't know God. They don't understand how God provides. But now you who knows God, who calls him your heavenly father, even better, you are made after his own image and likeness. And the Bible says he is even conscious of your need. So, imagine you're going to God to ask for food when he knows you need food. It's offensive. You go to God to ask for raiment when he knows that you need raiment. And you are his child? That's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But some people are like that. Some people are still at the realm of God. We need food. Christians send messages to their friends and family. I have slept hungry for two days. I slept hungry for three days. I don't have clothes. I don't have these Christians. Believers. Yes, believers. And some Christians think that their problem is money. And yet it's not money. If you understand this someone, you realize that your problem is not money. And some of you feed, feed, feed people until you realize one day that even if you continue to feed them, they're not going to improve or move anywhere. And yet at one point you start feeling so conflicted in you as of whether you're really providing by the will of God or you're funding a certain rebellion. So to know God is to know how he works. Let me go a bit deeper. So he tells you, don't worry about what you eat, you'll drink. Oh, no, 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 no. The heathen worry about these things. You settle and says, but for all that you can do, seek the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, God has introduced us to the realm of addition. And I want to separate addition and multiplication. Okay? Addition and multiplication. You need to understand how the addition of the Spirit works and the multiplication of the Spirit works. Because if you don't understand that, you will not grow as you must. In any aspect, by the way. Financial, ministry, family, and any other aspect of life. So, for example, when the Bible says when they broke bread, the Lord added unto them. What is this addition? How does the realm of addition work? He says, how does the realm of addition work? How does the realm of multiplication work? The Lord multiplied them. What is the difference between the addition of the Spirit and the multiplication of the Spirit? Now, when it comes to food, raiment, the basic necessities of human life, those are supposed to be added to you because they don't dwell in the realm of seed and harvest. Seed and harvest works more efficiently and by revelation more distinctly in the realm of the kingdom of God. 
in the realm of the kingdom of God. You need to understand how it works. Now, when we get into the kingdom of God, remember, the people he's talking to in Luke, he tells them, seek ye. That means they're not there. He's trying to drive them into a certain realm. They have not yet embraced the realities of the kingdom. And they cannot until that translation of the Christ happens at the death and resurrection of Jesus. So the kingdom is come when Jesus is dead and raised to glory. From that transition of his shedding of blood and then going to hell, making a public spectacle of them all and then rising up to glory, then the kingdom is birthed as we know it. Remember before that, John the Baptist, repent ye for the kingdom of God is at hand. When John is killed, Jesus continues, repent ye for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now in Luke 12, when he tells them, seek ye the kingdom of God, in the seeking really, he's telling them, stay attuned to what is going to happen. So that at the point of transition, you through faith as well will transition into the realm of the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God was not yet come because Christ had not uh, been crucified, dead, and raised to glory. And I want you to note that the people Jesus is speaking to at that hour, even though they are the children of men, sons of men, they are his disciples. They are following a certain way of the Spirit. But they are not completed in the words that are spoken because there is a transition coming through the kingdom of God later that is going to justify and align and connect them to a deeper responsibility in the life of the Spirit. So, when we enter into the kingdom of God, remember, here he told them, seek ye the kingdom of God, his righteousness, and, he says, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, when it comes to food, raiment, these are things that are added unto us. But to be added unto a thing does not mean that you have the ability to multiply a thing. You understand? Daily provisions for you to have a meal does not mean you have the ability to feed multitudes. The ability for you to carry an addition of a cloth today and tomorrow, raiment the other week and next month, they mean that you have the ability to clothe many. When we get into the place of the kingdom, then the principle of seed and harvest is established. And the principle of seed and harvest in there is not for your addition, it's for your multiplication. Because seed is planted in the ground for multiplication. For multiplication. Now, for as long as the earth remaineth, he has said, there shall be seed time and harvest. That's the work of the earth. To produce seed and harvest. That's the work of the earth. But the way these things are apportioned by man to connect to this principle is different from the way the creation, the world, the plants, the animals of this world respond to the same. Now, you awaken to the consciousness that as long as you live, God has provided for you to eat food because the earth every day is, you know, multiplying through seed to feed men. But that doesn't mean that because there is food available, every man in the world is eating. It's like people who live in very rich nations, first world nations. They mean that everybody living in the first world nation is eating food. No, that people actually who die of starvation in first world nations. Because it's one thing for the earth to provide all that is necessary, for a nation to provide all that is necessary, but it's another for an individual to have access to the same. You need to understand how the kingdom of God works. Because when you do, you will understand that multiplication is for seed and harvest. Addition is simply in the daily graces for humanity. Anybody can add. Anybody can add unto something. But not everybody knows how to multiply a thing. So when we enter into the spaces of the kingdom, we seek not only to be added unto, no, but we seek to understand how to multiply the things that are added unto us. So that when we're talking about giving, for example, in the New Testament, we're not talking about giving as, you know, a transaction to be added unto. Our giving is no longer transactional. It is revelation in the gratitude that we have toward God for the daily benefits that are added unto us, but for the right to be able to multiply the same. And why am I saying that? Because the church today is becoming transactional. And because of that, some of you, your seeds are misplaced 
because they are in the realm of addition, not multiplication, because you don't know truly the things that are supposed to be added and how to multiply the things that are added. So, the ravens have not sowed, they have not reaped, they don't have store bands, God has provided for them. And he's saying, but you're better. That means, whether you sow or reap or whatever, I will give you food. And you spoiling people. Ask God who wrote these things. It's not me. Did he add on, but for you, you have to sow to get this? No. He said, if the ravens do not sow, they don't reap, they carry no barns or storehouses, they don't say, but I provide for them. He says, how much more you? That means, I can still do the same for you, even if you don't sow. Not everybody in the world who is eating food has sown it. Not everybody in the world who is enjoying any pleasantry of provision stored it or had a bun for it. And you know it. Not everybody eating in the world has worked with their own hands to eat. And if you say, oh, you know, it's because I don't need to work to be provided for, I stay here, then you've forgotten the responsibility of the kingdom. Because you can't be born again and think that way. You cannot have the Spirit of God and be comfortable with simply eating food and putting on clothes. Then you have a big problem. You need deliverance. But God is saying, this, I don't need seed harvest. These ones I'll give you. Like I gave Adam and Eve without, I'll give you. I'll give you. Even in the most fallen nature, God can still find a way of providing for you. There are people in first world countries that are living entirely on government. But they are eating food. They are eating food. They are not working, but they are eating food. And some Christians there are comfortable with eating food from the government. As I said, if you think that way and you stay in that mentality, then you have a big problem. Because it means you're not going to be involved in the bigger responsibility of changing your nation, your generation. And multiplying things. The power of multiplying things. But these things shall be added. Are just additions. They are additions. But when you enter the kingdom of God. When you connect to the realm of God. You don't give your tithes. Your offering. Whatever God has impressed on your heart. For you to be added unto. The seed of the New Testament. Is not a sustaining seed. It's a multiplying seed because the way of a seed is to multiply. So you don't enter the New Testament with the mentality of, I am tithing so I can continue having food on my table. No, there are people who are not tithing or giving, but they still eat food. No, I am doing this because I understand that not only have I the responsibility of receiving of what God has given me and made ready for my provision. But also, I have a responsibility to the world and many people around in my life to be able to provide for them, but I must learn how to multiply. So when we get into the New Testament, we understand why he giveth the seed to the sower and bread to the eater, that he might multiply their fruits of righteousness. That he might multiply their seed because there we're talking about the principle of multiplication, not addition. In the kingdom, we talk about multiplication, not addition. So you don't just give. So you be, you know, if you don't give, you'll not eat food today. No. If you're starving, if you believe and you don't have food, there's a part in you that is fallen. And that's the thing I need to help you understand. That whether you give or not, at least trust that God will provide. At least have the conviction in your spirit that God will provide for you. At least have the faith. If you can't plant with your own hands, at least have the faith that if a raven does not plant but can reap and does not have a storehouse or a barn but has provision, God will provide for me even though I don't give. But you can choose to stay there. If you stay there, God will just add unto you enough to sustain you for the next day. In this life of Christianity, you'll stay a survivor. You'll just survive. But when you transition from just addition into the multiplication of the things of the kingdom, you'll understand why you give. You'll understand why you give your first fruits or your tithes or more than tithes. Some of us no longer even tithe. We give way above that for the obvious reason. Because we're in a transition. We're in a dispensation. We're in a covenant that is bigger than a tenth. You understand? When you enter the kingdom, you feel that you are actually there to give. 
it becomes more meaningful to the blessing of giving than receiving. You look so much at how much you give, not so much at how much you receive. In fact, the consciousness of how much should come to you dies because you are awakened to how much is available for you in Christ. You are awakened at how much is available for you by God. The Holy Spirit is the guarantee of the things the Bible says that have been freely given to us by Christ. So when you have the Holy Spirit, you know how much is available for you. You are working to that consciousness. When you're in that realm, we are no longer even talking about food or raiment. We are not talking about the realm of addition. Now, I wish you translate this and get it just from money and get into the spaces of ministry and understand how ministry multiplies. Because some of you pastors, you are watching me right now, your eyes have to open to understand that I'm talking about more than money. This is a principle that cuts through all that God would ever provide for humanity. And I pray that your eyes will open to see that you can have a church where people just added on. The additions in the church were because people could share food. The multiplication in the church was because people could share the message. The message is a multiplier. Basic food is an addition. Because food, raiment, those are in the realms of addition. If you, you know, do NGO work and then take clothes, to be, yeah, 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 you can have additions. But multiplication comes in the message that you give to the people. God multiplies the seed. Luke 8, 11, the parable is that the seed is the word of God. So when in Genesis it says, for as long as the earth remaineth seed and harvest time, shall exist. He's giving us the principle of multiplication. But some have submitted themselves in the same principle of seed and harvest for the realm of addition. For the realm of addition. What am I trying to say? You don't need to do anything for God to give you food if you know God, if you understand who really God is. And neither do you need to do anything for God to give you clothes unless you don't really understand who God is. But when you enter the kingdom of the faith, you learn what it means to multiply whatever God has promised to give. And that's when you respect the seed. That's when you respect the harvest. But also, in whatever man could ever do, no one can ever outdo God's work in your life. So, instead of looking to your works toward God, invest more time at looking at yourself as a work of God. To believe that God is working on me. He's working on me. He loves me. I'm his child. He has to look after me. Why would I lack anything? He's my father. Why would I need anything? He's my father. If I need anything, I should believe God that it has to be available. By reason of the fact that I'm a son. But if I need to learn how to multiply that very thing in which I am persuaded that my God will supply, then I must know how to appropriate the principle of seed and harvest. But only and only if I am in the realm of understanding what this kingdom he has given me means. Not many will understand this sermon the first day. But as you continue listening to it once or twice, you'll get it. Such that your seed carries a bigger name than addition. There are many people who give, but they are broke. And they don't seem to understand it. But God, I give my tithe. I give more than tithe. I give first fruit. I help this. I give that. I give the poor. I do everything. But I'm still stuck. This is why you are trying to appropriate the realities of the realm of the kingdom, but with a mindset of a man who has not entered the kingdom. And therefore, you reap the results of an addition for survival instead of the results of a multiplication to feed many. And tonight as I'm sharing, I believe that God is giving you a mindset change. A mindset change. Why? Because when Jesus was speaking to these people in Luke 12, he gave a very clear distinction 
between a believer, a follower, a disciple, and a pagan or an unbeliever. For them, seed and harvest is for their addition. Although they themselves are learning to even multiply. Now, even the heathen, the unbelievers of this world, have learned the principles of multiplication, even though they are not connected to the kingdom we're in, because certain principles in the kingdom even work for men outside the kingdom. And we believers are so disconnected from this reality that there are still believers on this earth who are still lacking food and clothes. And that has to change. But more than that, that will transition into the responsibility where we will learn the principle of seed and harvest, touching the kingdom for the purposes of multiplication and walk out simply from the things that are added. From the things that are added. Because we are in the place, in the kingdom already. And at that particular point when Jesus was speaking to his disciples, they had not yet entered the place he was inviting them into. We still let them seek ye the kingdom. In the New Testament, we don't seek the kingdom. The kingdom of God is come upon us. We cast out devils, we cleanse lepers. He says, if you see these things, then know ye that the kingdom of God is with you. It's in our hearts through faith. So we're not struggling to seek the kingdom. We are in the kingdom. In fact, the New Testament believer should strive to understand the kingdom in which they are. And every believer should know that you are called to multiplication and not just addition. Addition is okay, but you are called for more than that. You are called to multiply to the glory of God. I want to pray with you. And I pray that in more than just the words I've shared, you will understand. You will connect to the power of multiplication that is available this hour for you and for me. And not only financially, but spiritually, ministry-wise, family-wise, and every other aspect that you'll see multiplication. Not just growth, because you can grow by adding, but God wants you to grow by multiplication. I want you to learn to name your seed with a certain identity of more than just survival and addition, but multiplication. So whatever you do in the kingdom, it's worthwhile. Because you have the revelation of what you are doing. You're not just doing it because you see somebody else do it. But you have the revelation of what you're doing. And in receiving, you also know what and how to receive from God. Your expectations are defined in the message that you receive tonight. If you understand these things, not only will you never look for food or clothes again, but more than that, you'll multiply everything God gives you. It shall not be added only to end in the adding for your survival, you will live bigger than you. You will live for more than you. God will start bringing many lives to you because what is on you is bigger than one individual and millions and billions of people will feed from you because you have more than enough for you and for all of them that shall come to you in substance, in matter, in time, in space, in revelation, in the message, in wisdom, in understanding, in the anointing, in everything that pertains to human life and godliness. In Jesus' mighty name. Now I want you to raise your voice and speak to God right now. Speak to God right now. Tell God for the things that I understand I receive tonight. Come on, pray. Pray, 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 pray. She lebros oloboko she rabakatalaba. Robo zile proko zike sheke tele mandara bazaka broko sheke leba. Robo zike tele broko rababa kose tele payaka. Renda la bakoso brozolo boko sharaba zeke tele poyera baba rike tele brozolo bo shakaramando robo satala ba yerebo rete ke tele brozolo makasha talaba kota la mando lo bo zeke shele bakaya laba rando soto lo boko talaba kodi ke zeke 
Asa prata la bakaji le brozo lo manda ke shoto lo po. Rinde le ke shile le bo satalaba. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never will come to an end. There are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh Lord. You every morning, oh, great is I Mandorobosa, Satake Brosa la Mayerebo, Sireke Shindes Lebo Seleva, Kishele Brosa Ranele Mando. I want to decree upon your life that you will never lack not food, nor raiment. Because you're not in the realm. Even the men God was speaking to were not a new creation. They were not yet converted to the kingdom. And that you are invited in a kingdom of multiplication. That your seed is not for food and raiment. But it's for multiplication for anything that God will ever bestow upon you. Or has already been bestowed for you in Christ. And that he will give you the wisdom to understand the difference. And as you connect to that, I speak multiplication. I speak increase and a growth, a supernatural speed. Like you have never imagined before. If you're sick in your body, may you speed up to heal. May you be restored to health quickly. For those of you that are struggling in finances, I have not given you a message to get food. I've given you a message to come out of lack to multiplication. For pastors in the ministries, may your ministries not just have additions, but may they multiply by reason of the message touching the kingdom. In every aspect, our families are blessed, our careers are blessed, our institutions are blessed, our dreams are blessed. And I'm certain that you're a better man now than before you tuned into this summer and that you're going to be better next week than you have ever been all your life combined in jesus mighty name i prayed and believed amen now if you're there and you've never given your life to christ there is no name given among men which men are saved but the name of jesus and uh, the bible is clear the sound of that name every knee bows every tongue confesses that jesus christ is lord to the glory of the father that name takes you into the kingdom it allows you to enter a new realm a realm of god and so i want to give you an opportunity to invite you to pray with me as you receive jesus as your lord and savior don't second guess don't first prepare yourself god wants you as you are and i believe that tonight is your time so repeat these words after me say lord jesus i thank you because you died for my sins and was raised for my glory and tonight I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior I'm born again 
Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest. <laughs>